you guys, if you watched Worlds today, you probably noticed a five-game series between Cloud9 and Gambit Gambit. A little bit, a little bit difficult to miss that one. And as always happens, when a team struggles against another opponent that they're supposed to beat, there is a gigantic fervor of, well, maybe this entire region is absolutely garbage. Especially when it happens to North America, because frankly, enough is enough at this point. But rather than pass entire judgments on Team Liquid and 100 Thieves, trust me, we have plenty of time to do that later. I think now is a good time to just kind of look at Cloud9 and perhaps what might be the biggest concerning factor for them going into the games in group stage. First of all, let's try to establish whether or not there is even a basis to be concerned for Cloud9. Looking at the historical narrative around play in group stage, obviously teams like WE and Fnatic have done sort of poorly in that venue and still advanced on to get out of the main stage group stage in the tournament proper and go to quarterfinals, and in WE's case, even semifinals. But not only did Cloud9 st struggle in the group stage, they also went to five straight games against Gambit in the advancement stage. So the question then becomes, is it just that Gambit are that good? Well, Gambit did come in with a pretty good game plan. Obviously in the playing group stage, they played much more scaling compositions, didn't have a lot of pressure in their lanes and had super slow games against the likes of G-Rex that didn't focus that much on objective control and really translating their leads into something meaningful. Against Cloud9, however, I thought that they had a really good idea. They knew that Cloud9 would probably go for things like Akali and Kindred if they were left open, and came out with like a really smart composition with Poppy, Anivia, Tom Kench, Varus, and Urgot, things that can really deny picks like that, and really set up team fights that are difficult for Cloud9 to tackle. I really don't think we should just dismiss what Gambit managed to accomplish against Cloud9 as saying that Cloud9 have so many problems. Cloud9 are showing too many weaknesses when teams like EDG can stomp their competitors because I do think that Gambit showed something pretty smart here, had a good adaptation, had a few colors and a few ideas going into this tournament as a whole. However, the fact that uh, Gambit could identify something that they themselves could punish is more where I sort of want to take this going forward and where I kind of want to look at Cloud9's problems here. In the plan stage, I've consistently found fault with Cloud9's early game, specifically paying attention to the global elements that the enemy team will have, or just in general what the other lanes are doing when they're making a play in another lane. There's a big, huge laser focus on Dragon, which is very typical of North America as a region, and a lot of that just involves fighting over Dragons when it's up, regardless of kind of paying attention to the circumstances. Here, if you notice that Kira backed pretty early on, that gave him priority to make this play, even though Jensen typically would have advantage here. Uh, Gambit managed to control this area pretty well, largely because the bottom lane is pushed up, Sneaky can't do anything to join, and they have amazing sticking potential and zoning through the Tom Kench and the Poppy. This just means that Gambit immediately get this Infernal here, continue to control the area, and just take over the game in general. At this point where I have the VOD paused, we can definitively say that Cloud9 are aware that Gambit are moving around the dragon. Obviously, we already pointed out that Kira got back priority and is able to push this wave when we already know that Jensen has been controlling the lane until that point. So this is obviously a really good time and a really smart position for Gambit to make a play around Dragon if they want. Bottom lane has been pushed up pretty effectively all game, so that, that hasn't changed much. But at this point, the, the wave is... Going into a position where the, the two waves will meet at the same time in the middle of the lane again and C9 actually have the ability to roam. Gambit trying to push this out as fast as possible so that C9 have to move back and answer the wave. But for now, you know, they're moving defensively, maybe trying to see if they can find pink wards and clear out any vision Gambit have kind of placed so that Gambit feel less safe going for this dragon. This is all fine. Obviously, Blabber is up here in base. now. Cloud9 have a couple of choices here. Most likely, they are not going to be able to deny Gambit this dragon if they want. They can try to stall. Obviously, Blabber is level 6. He'll have his ultimate. Everything's in position so that they can maybe disengage a fight. They can stall out Gambit's time to the point where 
they feel threatened on topside or they feel like they have to move away from the dragon and look for an opportunity later on. Because, again, as we've already pointed out, naturally, mid lane should have a lot of pressure. So if you can get to a point where Jensen just stays in lane and pushes and pushes and C9 eventually have enough pressure there that Gambit back off of the dragon, that's fine. Alternatively, C9 should know that most likely, considering how much power bottom lane has had, they're not going to get this dragon, right? This dragon, in most scenarios, is going to be Gambit's dragon. This isn't the best for them because obviously you have the Anivia, you have the Varus, but you still are in a pretty good position scaling-wise to use the Kai'Sa, to use the Victor, to use even the Akali, so it's not terrible to give up the dragon right now, as long as you don't give up its two. It's not the worst thing ever to give up an Infernal at this point in the game, considering you have a Kai'Sa on your side. So in that case, it's almost beneficial because of this wave and this wave on top side, and the fact that we see Urgot moving away, presumably to join a me fight or something along those lines. We also have this mark spawning up here. You have a pretty good idea after Akali goes in that we're going to have pressure on their blue buff and can try to maybe deny that or make a play. Not exactly the best trade for the Infernal, but not bad. Start getting priority on top side, maybe reset your bottom lane and take the initiative to swap when you're giving up Drake and Tower's almost gone. Said obviously we already saw what happened, and I call that a problem of knowing when to trade sides and knowing when you are not strong, when you're not playing a tier strong side, when you aren't playing to priority, and we covered that kind of a little bit to an extent in the KLG video, so I think that that's a really big issue with Cloud9 is just their unwillingness to give up dragons. Obviously, I don't really think this is a blabber-specific problem or even specific to any one member of C9. They just seem to be a little confused as to where their strong side here is. Diamond Prox has pretty good gank in mid lane. They punish the Cassidy early when he should be p punished, but then, obviously, in bottom lane, we're not aware of what's going on just there. There's There seems to be just a complete lack of communication or expectation. I don't know, maybe they think they can avoid getting hooked and Licorice will teleport in, so it's fine, there's whatever. But that isn't really why I'm looking at this clip, and that's what I'm not most concerned by. Let's talk a little bit about Cloud9's state of the game here. We know that uh, Zazel is just about to respawn, Diamond Prox also just about to respawn, but you've had Kira back at about 4.30, so if we take 30 seconds as a rule, we know that we have to be concerned about him in maybe 15 seconds maximum, right? He'll probably be back a little bit doing something, at least on his side of the map, a bit before then. But in terms of being back in his lane, yeah, about, about 15 seconds, we, we have to worry about that. We know that most likely diamond prox can move pretty fast because he is playing the talia you have the passive you have the terrain in place so the question then becomes why is licorice backing and why is fen and deciding that you know this is the best possible option that he can make at this time by going in for this red buff and trying to make the trade on this side of the jungle let's go ahead and see if this pays out for him all right here we go he's going in you have sneaky not really able to catch up with the push on the wave as quickly as Boris, who has a stacked wave building up. Edward can roam very freely. Sneaky isn't in position to catch up to him. Jensen definitely isn't positioned to catch up to him because he just got back to lane. And uh, yeah, that, that went about as you could expect. Obviously, I can't necessarily super fault Svenskeren for going for that because he felt probably a bit desperate and felt like he had to make a trade at some point to make to just to just get something you know because that that was a pretty huge cascade of devastation coming in there if i can fault svenskeren it might be more to do with the fact that the team as a, as a whole made the call for licorice to tp there i'm not really sure what they thought was going to happen at that point but licorice had a lot of pressure on top side maybe they could have redirected in that direction at least get some vision right to to make a play for a better invade and a little bit later date when Cassidy is about to hit six right Cassidy's about to hit six he could have a, a fair amount of pressure at that point so just just kind of a little bit of lack of forethought not really aware of why we're giving up pressure on top side and going for that automatically not necessarily even a communication or a game plan of how they want to work that out 
before going into game and whether or not they want to use the Jarvan. Because obviously they blind picked the Jarvan top lane, right? They blind picked the Jarvan top lane instead of saving it. They saved the counter pick mid. So if you're picking something that is going to have that kind of lane pressure, then at least have some idea that if we're going to get pressure on top, maybe we can play around top. Maybe we can do something like that. So I, I just am wondering a bit where the, the priorities are lying. That's that's more my concern than just Fenskaren making one small sort of boneheaded mistakes after a long list of boneheaded mistakes. <laughs> and if we go back to the Detonation Focus Me video that I did on the first day, this just all is sort of symptomatic of Cloud9 not necessarily having the best team-wide map awareness. And the reason why I'm circling so hard on the bottom lane stuff is because you may or may not remember the group that Cloud9 are most likely to be in. Yeah, that one, the one with the RNG and Gen.G and Team Vitality and the teams that like to kind of pick and play through their bottom lane. I'm not about to start speculating as to exactly how Cloud9 are going to do in that group. That's more of a narrative wake type job, but I do think I want to talk a little bit about just the warning signs that Cloud9 are giving in play in and whether or not it's really a big deal. Right now, I, I don't necessarily think it has to be. There are a few kinks to work out. It's it's just obviously, if you remember spring, I was pretty impressed with how Cloud9 played super well around the Grish. So there are alternatives and there are definitely times where Cloud9 have looked good playing around the opposite side of the map, making good uh, smart trades. And I do think that there are situations where, especially against RNG, where you can play hard around your bottom side of the map as long as you're kind of counterpicking your bottom lane and really understand those types of dynamics. But the, the really big factor, the thing that even though RNG and Genji don't always have the best early games, is that they are really pretty good at understanding the balance across their lanes as the game progresses, which I feel like Cloud9 are almost clueless in comparison, and that's that's generally a bigger warning sign. Obviously, there are probably those of you who are saying, oh, why isn't she doing a warning signs for Game Edward Gaming video? I just felt that this was more topical because we haven't really had a play-in team go to a five-game series before, before qualifying. Even Fenerbahce, right, only had a four-game series against Team One. So to me, it's a bit more concerning and a bit more interesting to discuss if if we should be worried more about Cloud9. I don't think we should be worried that much because of five games. I think Gambit put up a good fight. I think what's more worrying is just kind of the types of mistakes that they're making and the group that they're most likely to get put into.